can't believe I've gotten to this point. Although this is my 12th review of the Booker Longlisted Books for 2021 that is going up on my channel, it is the last one that I'm filming. So after I do this, I'll have actually filmed all of the reviews of all of them and then I'll have to figure out what to do with my life post Booker. Not ready to do that. Hi, my name is Sarah Freshly and welcome back to Freshly Red Books. So, The Promise by Damon Galgut. I think when I uploaded like my first review for one of the longlisted books, there were comments on that video being like, I can't wait till you get to The Promise. This book has been talked about so much leading up to when I finally got to read it, which it was the last book that I read. Um, that I I was worried going in that I wouldn't love it and or that my expectations would be too high and while I do think that that did almost take away from my experience especially at the beginning of the book I get it I get why people love this book it's my goodness Galgut can write like wow <laughs> So this book follows a family, a white family in South Africa uh, over the course of about 20 years, I think, and it's separated into four parts and each part is a funeral. And this is really the only time that the family really comes back together. Um, I think some of the members of the family do see each other outside of like these four funerals, but a lot of the meetings, especially of the main characters, are only during that time. As a framework for a book, I think that this is a fantastic idea. And after watching an interview with Damon Gallagher, this was the initial piece of the story that like kind of sparked. And then it grew obviously into a much larger and very well-rounded story with uh, complex characters and it says a lot. One thing that I found the most fascinating about it, I guess, is just how the story kind of picks up the pace as it goes along. At the very beginning, I would say that it is, it feels pretty slow, but maybe that's just because we're like getting to know and meet a lot of characters all at once since we're starting with a funeral and everybody coming together, that's a lot of people to get to know all at the same time. And then as the story progresses, I mean, it kind of feels like it, a ball on a ramp that like once it starts going, it's pretty slow, but it is on a ramp and it just like really picks up the pace and doesn't let it go <laughs> towards the end. And with that, I found myself liking the book more and more as it went on. At the beginning, I was really worried because everybody was talking about how much, how great the book was and how much people will love it and uh, people saying that they're excited for me to read this book. And I started it and I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> I don't think I like this. But as the story progressed, I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I get it now. <laughs> like, this is a really good and uncomfortable and beautifully written book. It jumps through perspectives and uh, where we have first, second, and third perspective all in it. There's perspective from quite a few different characters, mostly the core family, that being um, the father and three children. The first funeral is the mother of this family, so we don't get much about her. And then also the, there will be like random jumps to other characters that are kind of more peripheral, I guess. And it's done in a very interesting way. Also, this review is not going to be a spoiler-free review. Um, I am going to talk about what happens uh, fully throughout, just because I think it is so impactful. That being said, I think that if you don't mind being spoiled, that you'd still get a lot out of this book. If you haven't read it yet and you wanted to watch this video and then read it, I still think you'd get so much out of reading it. Uh, there's no way what I talk about in this video is going to be enough to give you the same feelings that the book, that reading the book would give you, but also totally understand. If you don't wanna watch it now, you wanna read, have the full experience and then come back later, that's good too. So theme wise, I'm going to start with one that I haven't heard as much conversation on when discussing the book, probably because it's not like the predominant thing that the book is about. 
Um, I mean, it, it crops up a lot, but there is something that we will get to that is, I mean, it, the namesake of the book and is hugely important and Galgett does a great job with it. But I'd like to start with uh, the religion that's represented in the book. So I didn't really think about how religion would play such a big role, but like obviously because this book is centered around four funerals and those are typically a place where religion is very present, the religion of the deceased. And a lot of the characters believe in different things. Um, and actually that's a strong word. <laughs> believe is a strong word. A lot of the characters move through different um, religions, I guess. And I was surprised by how much change there was with these characters. And that's not to say that like people were going back and forth between different things, but we've got a character that is very much about uh, spirituality and um, she's super into that. We have a character that uh, becomes Catholic and uses it as a way to wash herself of her sins where she feels totally fine sinning and then she'll just go to confession and then tell the priest and he's like all right you're good to go and <laughs> she's like man this is great but then of course because of these factors in their lives when it comes to funeral time there's undoubtedly people that are upset by the way that the funeral is being held even if it is the religion that the deceased person held and it's very interesting to see like those shifts throughout the book so I had to mention it even though it's not as pervasive as some of the other uh, themes I guess throughout the book and now I had this next section as being two different sections in my mind and my notes <laughs> how I wanted to approach this video but now that I'm thinking about it I think it does make sense for it just to be in one because it just interweaves so much. So I want to talk about Amor and the Promise. Amor is the character in this family that does not die. Um, she is the youngest child in the family. So we've got the parents and then three uh, children, that being um, Astrid, Anton, and then Amor. Ma, the mother, dies in the, uh, the first part is her funeral. The second part is the father's funeral, the third is Astrid's, and the fourth is Anton's. So at the end of the book, Amor's the only one left. This is something that becomes very apparent um, immediately, basically, that this is going to happen. One, because we know that the book centers on four funerals. Each part in the book has the character's name that the funeral is going to be for. But anyways, uh, <laughs> Amor. So, she is the youngest uh, child within this family and she sees all of her family members pass away and goes to these funerals. She is also a, such a fascinating character. So she's probably the most mysterious character out of all of them. She is struck by lightning at the beginning of the book and there, there's this feeling in the family that maybe she's a little slower than others, or maybe there's some impact that this has had on her mental state because of, or her ability to process things because of this, because of being struck by lightning. However, Amor is by far the best morally. All of the other characters are, oh, kind of tough to read at a lot of points. They're like funny in a weird way. Um, especially her aunt like basically everybody in the family is racist to a certain extent and uh with the exception of a more i would say but we'll get back to that but they do there's more to them than just being racist of course they like they are fully formed characters but it does make them hard to read and it it feels weird to be like reading their stories and not just outright disregarding them, I guess, because you know what their feelings are and you don't agree with those feelings. So that's the kind of family that Amor is in. Uh, but she is a good deal different from them. However, she still is white and is therefore very privileged. And you're with her at the point in the book when she realizes that racism is even a thing and just the privilege of that in itself to go for that much of her life not understanding. I mean, she's young, but still she 
she would have learned it a lot faster if she wasn't white is what I'm saying. So Amor has this kind of mysterious air about her because you never really understand her or what she's thinking. Even though she is alive for the entire story, unlike many other characters, you follow the other characters within their current lives uh, and you don't really get to do that with Amor. So she remains this kind of mystery. She lives uh, far away from where the family lives um, and really only returns for these funerals. She's hard to get a hold of. She doesn't have a cell phone. She just uses a landline and she'll move without anybody knowing where she's moved to um, or what the new number is for that landline. So she's kind of hard to pin down quite literally, but she also seems like such a good person. And because of that, the other characters seem to think that she is simple or kind of silly and the way that they talk to her or refer to her and I think it also comes from her being the youngest in the family. It's just very clear that they don't really think the same of her intellectually as maybe some of the other characters and while they definitely have complaints about the other characters as well I think it's almost like they can't really fault him more for anything so instead they fault her for not being smart because if she was smarter then she wouldn't be doing what she's doing she wouldn't be working at a hospital and like helping people objectively like she helps people for a living and they still see that as like a like why is she doing that that's so silly not to mention specifically where the title of the book comes in the promise amour is the only one trying to uphold this promise so this promise is from the mom to the housekeeper or caretaker of the home they lived in uh, and that is salome so salome has been taking care of this house and the people in it since she was young and the mother promises her that they will give her the farm and the house. And Amor uh, either overhears the promise or overhears her mother and father talking about the promise. So Amor wants to make sure that this promise is going to be upheld. And she talks to her father about it. She basically makes him re-promise that they are indeed going to give the house and the farm. But when her father passes away and they're looking at the will, he did not put that into the will. And as the youngest daughter, she doesn't have the ability to do this. Um, also, it is not legally possible to give uh, Salome, a black woman, the, the rights, the, the property itself, like the deed to this property. So legally, it's not possible right now. And as the reader, you're kind of going through and, and thinking like, okay, well, that's stupid. Um, but fine, I guess right now it's not legally possible. And then uh, Astrid passes away, the oldest sister. And it, there's just Anton and Amor left. And Anton is in charge of the property. It is now legal to be able to give the farm and the house to Salome. However, <laughs> Anton uh, doesn't really want to do this. And already, I think at this point, the promise has been lessened from the farm and the house to being just the house. And I can't remember the reasons behind that, but I think really the point of this promise is at every point you're kind of like, okay, you know, there's something that's preventing you from being able to fulfill this promise like you intended, but you know, the, the want to do it is still there, especially for Amor, the way that she's like keeping in check with people and you're kind of like on Amor's side about it. And then when it comes to her discussion with Anton and he's all of a sudden trying to make this deal where they'll be able to do some project that he wants to do and um, he'll give the house to Salome like as an exchange for doing whatever work that he wants done. And Amor's like, no, like you already promised this. like. At this point, she's made Anton separately promise this. It's not it's not her mother and father's promise anymore. Anton has promised Amor that he would do this. And she's like, yeah, you already promised this. Like, this isn't a deal. Like, you already did this. So no, we're not gonna like now negotiate a way for you to fulfill this promise that you have. And at this point, I was like, cause I already knew that Anton was going to pass away uh, uh, because the fourth part was called Anton. 
and I was so ready for him to die because I was like, let Amor give these people what they were promised. And he does, and she does. She comes to them and says that she's going to give them, at this point, just the house. Um, and But at this point, the house is like dilapidated. It's got holes in the roof. Anton didn't keep up with it. There were so many things that really needed to be fixed up about it and he just didn't do it. And so it's not even like much of anything anymore at this point. And not only that, it's been like 20 years since this promise was given to Salome. And Amor's telling her that like, yeah, I'm finally doing this. And not only her, but also Salome's son, uh, Lucas, I believe. And she's saying, like I'm I'm here to fulfill this promise and the son's like hey, it is way too late like why why do you think we even want this anymore like look at it it doesn't it won't matter at this point like this isn't good enough you you only wanted to give this to us when it was easiest for you and then as a reader you kind of take a second and look back on all the all the times that the promise was discussed and you were really proud of Amor because she would bring it up and the family would be like, oh man, you're still on about this? Like, like it shouldn't matter at all. Like it's totally fine to not fulfill your promise. And like it's simple and silly thinking to want to fulfill the promise. And throughout all of that, like you're on a more side and you're like, yes, she's trying, she's talking about it. But then you start to realize all that she didn't do, that she didn't continue to push for this to be fulfilled, even though like it should be theirs already. And she would leave for long periods of time. And yes, she was doing good things, but if this was really something that was that important to her, she wouldn't only bring it up when she happens to have to get back together with the family for funerals she would be bringing it up otherwise. Instead, you're looking back on all of this time that Amor spent and thinking, okay, so she wanted to fulfill this promise, but it, she's living about her normal life and then she comes back for a funeral, she's around her, her family and she's thinking, oh, that's right, there was that promise, let's check in on that. And otherwise she's unreachable when she's not with them, meaning that she's never calling them to try to push this through when she's not physically with them. And I think that that's really the root of this book is you're in your head praising Amor for these actions that she's taken, which is really just talking, it's not even actions but you're not thinking about all that she didn't do. And she didn't do so much. And even though she's by far the best character, morally main character, um, and character that you get to know enough to know how good they are morally, she is still unable to fully understand what the experience of others is like and what she is doing to contribute to that. And it's not until at the end, uh, Lucas is angry with her that you're like, wait, yeah, you, he should be angry. Like, why didn't, why wasn't I angry? By the time Amor and Anton were having their conversation, I was angry about the promise and specifically how that conversation went. But I should have been angry before that because that, that's so many years of being promised something that they should have had and not getting it. And you know what? They probably the whole time were thinking, yeah, that's not going to happen. And at this point, like they don't want it anymore. Like Salome doesn't want it. And then uh, the last theme that I wanted to talk about was um, focus, specifically the focus of the book and the focus of the characters that we focus on. That was a lot of saying focus. Um, but what I mean by this is we, this book is about a white family in South Africa. And the black characters are much smaller and more peripheral, even though we have, like the whole point of this is the promise made by this family to a black family, Salome and Lucas. It's still about the white family's perception of that promise, perception of those people when they're thinking about them at all, which they're typically not, which is why we hear so little about the black characters in the book. It's because we're on this white family that is, and it's so easy for them to forget 
and to not think about this promise, the, the black people, what they're dealing with, and to just live their own lives. Like none of that matters because they have the luxury to be able to do that. But it does make for a very uncomfortable book because in the absence of these other characters and what they're thinking and what they're feeling, because nobody's focusing enough on what they're thinking and feeling, and so you don't get that and you feel the lack of that. You feel the absences of that perspective and how much more narrow it makes the book feel. That even though you have all of these different characters within the family, not just the parents and children, but the aunt and uncle and um, the people that would marry into the family. There's a guru character and there's a priest uh, that are also within the story and you get to see things from their perspective. And those characters are all so very different from each other, but it still feels like such a narrow point of view because you know that there's these other characters that exist that have much different opinions about life, about the country, about uh, each other than what these, you know, white main characters have and you just don't get to hear it. And I think that it's the most clear when there's this portion of the story where you get the perspective of a homeless man um, named Bob, or actually I don't even think his name is Bob. I think that the book tells us, let's call him Bob or something along those lines. Also, this book breaks the fourth wall sometimes. It's very fun. Um, but also it's mostly to call you out as a reader and your prejudices. So it's by fun, I mean uncomfortable, uh, but needed, necessary. So this homeless man, Bob, uh, you follow him as the reader for a bit, uh, the way that he sees the world. And it's a little bit jarring when it, it starts and you're like, oh, this is weird and in a weird perspective to be taking. We're not seeing a ton of our main characters and instead we're following um, Bob as he goes about his day and where he's eating and uh, where he's sleeping. And then at the end of that section, the narration says something like, um, we don't need to like follow him anymore. Like he's just wasting your time. And it's another one of those instances where it calls you out as the reader about being like, yeah, didn't you feel like this guy was just wasting your time, that his perspective didn't matter? And you go about your whole life uh, ignoring these people and not thinking about them and not thinking about the constant state of hunger that they're in because it's uncomfortable for you to do. And by bringing that into it, it kind of makes you realize and think more about what other perspectives are we not seeing. And I think that that's what brings the awareness of the book as a whole, of the characters that we don't see uh, very often at least, and of the black characters and not knowing where they're coming from, what they're thinking about. Because we're in this family that even though there's a character like Amor who wants to do better, who wants to be a good person, she still has so much of her focus on herself, on the people in her family, on her job, which is good, but she still lacks focus in the characters that have become peripheral in her life, but are not peripheral at all. Like these are full human beings of their own and you as the reader don't get to know them and instead you just feel their absence like it's weighing down this book and like you've almost got blinders on and you're forced to only look at this family drama that's happening. And I feel like it's a portrayal of what it can be like to be white and to be able to easily ignore all of the bad things going on around you, how you have the luxury of not thinking about those things. And I think that's why it's so uncomfortable to read because you don't want to think about yourself in that way, but it's just, it's true. But yeah, it's, it's tough to think about it. It's tough to be in that situation, but it's even tougher to realize that none of that's tough at all in comparison to what people are, forced to deal with and can't look away from and can't ignore. Whew. Okay, final thoughts. Um, 
good book. <laughs> this is a really good book. I completely think that it belongs on the Booker shortlist and I could definitely see it winning the prize as a whole. As far as do I recommend this book? Do the Booker Frog and I recommend it? And that is going to be one big ribbit from us. But yeah, I think that this I would definitely recommend this book. I think it provides a different perspective that isn't seen a lot in in many novels and honestly for the writing alone. Like, oh, the writing. It's so good. So that's going to do it for this video. I don't even want to end this because this means that I'm done recording reviews for Booker. I hope that you enjoyed this video and if you did, um, think about maybe subscribing and then you can see what other videos I do. There's still one book review left after this one, which will be Bewilderment. Um, and then, <laughs> then you can see what I do after that. And I'll be doing some more, I think, lighthearted. I'll still be doing literary fiction, but I'll be bringing in some, uh, I guess, easier, more fun reads as well uh, into the mix. So it won't be all literary fiction all the time like it has been, but there will definitely be some literary fiction because I'm not ready to stop yet. All right, bye.